God lives in the now, prepared you for a future. Amen? Well, the Lord is good, and I am so glad, glad to be a Christian. You know, the Lord put a message on my heart to the people, and my son, James Jr., last week, did an excellent job of going into the history of holiness. Be ye holy. He did a good job of going down into the history. And he said something as I was listening to him communicate. In his day, they, they explained holiness into what you wore, what you would wear. He spoke about the white dresses, the white shoes, and the white suit. And I'm a little older than he is, and I remember what he's talking about. But in my day, they are, they are, are poor or less describe holiness as Pentecostals. I'm sure Brother Kelly, he's a little older than I am. And John, you're a little two or three months or maybe a year older, but anyway, there are pillars and our seniors. And, but anyway, in my day, they, it would, people would call the Pentecostals the holiness church. But all of those things was a deceptive opinion of what God really means when he say holiness and he decided to see to the people. Most people didn't want to have anything to do with holiness people because of the requirement that they thought that they would put on the people. You had to have white suits and you know we were better than someone else and it's not now. And I, let me give you my definition of holiness uh, and I ask the Holy Spirit because I'm going to talk to you this morning on a call to holiness. That's what God put in my heart. For this church I'm speaking to St. Peter's the people that God has sent me to lead, the people that God has directed me. Uh, and uh, I heard the Holy Spirit say this to my spirit, holiness is God's standard of living. But this is the danger. The devil has deceived people to think that holiness is more or less required that you just stop living. And see, there's the negative side of every conversation and there's the positive or the right side of every conversation. And Satan would always use the negative side to deceive people to hear what God did not mean. There's a positive side of holiness that if, I, if you give me some attention this morning, I will share with you a call because God has called the body of Christ into holiness. Not a particular race, creed, or denomination. Holiness is God and he's called the church into this. And you got to realize this, guys. It's a purpose. Everything God does is for a purpose. Holiness qualifies you for your future. God will never take you somewhere until you are qualified or ready. Holiness deals with our character, our conduct. And God will qualify you for your next assignment through the spirit of holiness. Amen. Don't see it as a negative. See it as a positive. God has qualified me for my next assignment. And see, if you walk away from that one word, you might miss your call. Because the Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. I want to be chosen by God to fulfill what he created me for. And if you are wise, you will want to do the same thing. So don't let the devil deceive you and see this word holiness as a negative in the mind of God to say positive. You just need to get the meaning of what God means from this word so that you can recognize he has qualified me, he has qualified the church to go to the next level. And if you turn away from it, you can allow your past to interfere with where God wants to take you. Now the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 51, 27, Raise us in the standard, the standard of God. That's what holiness is. It's God's standard, God's standard of living. Now, I want to help you because that's my assignment as, you, as your pastor to lead you into the land or to the blessing that God promised. God is in the blessing business. But your greatest hindrance of where God's going to take you is your past. So let me say this. Three things is vitally important about the standards of God. Number one, you give away your strength when you lower your standards. Because the Bible tells us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Never forget that. You give away your strength when you lower your standards in life. Number two, you cannot defeat your enemies that you will face in the world 
if you lower your standards. Because you're going to face some enemies in the world. And your greatest enemies is your past. The things you got exposed to before you got saved. And number three, you cannot live by the world's standards and defeat your adversaries in life. That's vitally important. Holiness is God's standard of living. And three things that is vitally important. You give away your strength when you lower your standards. Number two, you cannot defeat your enemies. You will face in the world if you lower your standards. And number three, you can't live by the world's standards and defeat your adversaries of the past or in your life. And that's what holiness is, God's standards of living. And if you walk away from that, you will, you will abort your whole destiny in Christ. Because you're going to have to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might to confront the adversaries that will oppose you as you move with God. So the devil has deceived people over the years to walk away or run from that one word holiness. No, no, it's God and we'll learn that this morning. Let's go back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, the first chapter, verse 26 through 28. Father, grant me the grace and the ability to communicate the mind of God to this great congregation of people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Notice here in the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, 26, when, and God said, let us make man in our image. That's very important. And after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth up on the earth. So God, verse 27, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Boy, that's a word in the season. Verse 28, and God blessed him. This is what God spoke to the, his creation. Be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth. Subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God gave his creation, this man, this woman, that he made in his image and his likeness. He said, you are to replenish the earth. Subdue and have the men. Let's look at this. Notice the next slide. See, God made man and woman after his image and his likeness. Spiritually, spiritually, God is a spirit. And God wanted to see his image in us. And mankind is to be a reflection of God, a mirror of God. A representation of God, a metaphor, a similar. That's our assignment. If they never see God or never read the Bible, they'll read our lives and they'll see God through us. We are here, God's representation to the world. We represent God in everything. You've been called out of the world, now you are part of the family of God. You are part of the household of faith. And we are made spiritually in his image and his likeness. Never forget that. And then notice he gave Adam a command, replenish to me, refill or to restore the earth with what sons and daughters of God made in his image and his likeness. That was Adam's assignment is to refill the earth with sons and daughters of God made in his image or likeness. Simply means People who have is a replica, we are to be a replica of God, the exact image of God. And God's sons and daughters, the family of God, the people of God, the household of faith, God's special people in the earth, people that have a relationship with God, who is a reflection of their father. And it goes down to the next one. Like father, like sons and daughters. Now, what you got to realize, for the sons and daughters to reproduce God's image and likeness, there had to be a reflection of God, a replica of God, God's special people. Now, what we also realize, so your flesh could not do that. 
It was spiritual reflection. It's a spiritual image. See, when Adam sinned in the garden, he no longer could produce sons and daughters of God because his spirit died, and God is a spirit. So Jesus had to come. Later on, I'm kind of ahead of myself. Let's go on back to the paper there. See, God calls Moses. God's people found, find out they were in Egypt crying out to God for help. So God raised up Moses, gives him his laws for his people. Now, God is always concerned about his family. We are the family of God. Israel was the family of God. Now, notice what in Romans 3, verse number 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So God gave Moses his law to show Israel, his people, the areas that they were sinning in. Because they didn't know it. A man that never read the Bible don't know he's sinning. The people that never come to church don't know what sin is. So Moses was a pastor, the leader, to bring the people that God was leading into the land of promise. And, and their actions and their attitude and their ways was not pleasing to God. So God gave Moses, his pastor, the law to inform the people of the areas that they were missing it in. Now what we have to learn here, sin destroys the image of God. Sin destroys the likeness of God. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So sin cannot produce the image of God. Sin destroys God's image. And when people get into sin, they bear the image of the flesh. Satan's nature is to control or his plan is to control people through sin. Now, what we got to learn is this right here. God is concerned about the state of his family. So he will give us a word to reveal to us his plan for our lives. Notice there in Jeremiah 2, verse number seven, 3, 7 and 8. Notice what God said about Israel, his people, his family. Israel was holiness unto the Lord. And the first fruit of his increase. All that devour him shall offend, evil shall come up with him, saith the Lord. So we're learning something right here. Israel, God's people, they were holiness unto God. Notice what happened in verse 7. And I brought you into a plentiful country. This is God talking to Israel. To eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land. And made my inheritance an abomination. Now get this right here, guys. This is a word to St. Peter's. Because God is raising us up for a purpose. God is raising you up for a purpose. And you got to learn where God is taking. You ain't seen nothing yet if you just line up with the word of God. Amen. But notice what God stated about the leaders. He said, the priests said not, where is the Lord? And they that hell the law Knew me not, God said. Then he said, even the pastors also have transgressed against me. And he said, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. So he dealing with the, he's dealing with the leaders. Know your leader. He said, the priest, he spoke a word. And this is what God said. He said, the leaders, the priests, the pastors, and the prophets are out of the will of God. They don't even know the ways of God. It's dangerous to have a leader that don't fear God. To have a leader that lost connection with God. To have a leader that won't tell the truth. He said the priest didn't know where God was. And he said they held the law with no respect to God but to please their flesh. He said even the pastors, they have transgressed against me. And he said even the prophets prophesying about things that I didn't say, walking out after the counsel of God. And they say they're doing things that don't produce profit. Jesus. 
This is what God said in Jeremiah 2, verse 13. He said, for my people, the people of God, have committed two evils. He said, they, number one, he said, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. And number two, he said, they have, so, they have, how's, what's the word? He said, they have hewed out system, broken system that can hold no water. Two evils, the people of God. He said, God, my people that I desire to bless have walked away from me. And they have forsaken me, number one. He said, they no longer look to me. They're walking in ways that take them away from me. And he said, now they have made broken system. System that cannot hold water that will not produce the life that I have for them. Whoa. We see that in the world today. So God said, God sent a word to Israel. Notice there in Leviticus, the 11th chapter, verse 44 and verse 45. For I am the Lord your God. He said, you shall therefore sanctify yourself and you shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourself with the manner of creeping things that creepeth up on the earth. Verse 45, he said, for I am holy. For I am the Lord that bringeth you out of the land of Egypt. Egypt is symbolic of the world. To be your God. He said, you shall therefore be holy. For I am holy. Don't see that word as a negative. No, no, no. This word came from God. And it has a purpose for giving it to the people of God. Because God is qualifying his people for the next level. I repeat, God is qualifying you. For them, tell your neighbor, God is qualifying you. So you can't give away your strength when you live or lower your standards. Notice that next slide, the people, which is the family of God, are to be holy unto the Lord. Everything we do, we do it as unto the Lord. We walk in this earth as unto the Lord. God is the authority in our life. And wherever he chooses to take us, because the Bible says the steps of a good man or a woman is ordered by the Lord. And when God see that I'm moving in the steps that he ordained me to walk in, what happened? He will qualify you for the next level. Now what we got to learn is this right here. His family, which is his special people, are living before the Lord. And as a result of that, it qualifies you for your next assignment and you will be chosen by the Lord to go places you never dreamed of going, to do things you never thought you could do, because God will qualify every one of us before he takes us there. God's not going to take you in areas that your character can't keep you. God's not going to put you in places that your character, you wouldn't send your children places that you know they're not ready for. So if you realize it, God has told me as the leader on the shepherd to Jesus, teach my people holiness so that they can be ready for the next assignment or the next level that I want to take St. Peter. There is another level that God is speaking here to you individually and to this church corporately that if we align up, we'll be ready to move to where God wants to take us. But if you say no to where God's going to take you, automatically you disqualify yourself for the life that God created you for. And wonderful, wonderful how many Christians out there today, here is God giving them a message on holiness, but they turn a deaf ear to it because they have heard the negative side of holiness. But not so here. We're not afraid of that word holiness. It's nothing but God's manner, God's way of uh, doing things. Are you there? Now what we realize is holiness empowers us to function in the earth as sons and daughters of God. Romans 1, 4, Jesus was declared to be the son of God with power, but it was according to the spirit of holiness, 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 guys. Don't turn a deaf ear to that word because it's going to qualify you to go to the next level. And if you turn away from it, your flesh will take over and your flesh will avoid and negate where God's going to take you. Israel was holiness unto the Lord. We, St. Peter's, you, 
James and George and Cecil and Lady George and Dennis and John and every brother Kelly. We are holiness unto the Lord. John, we are holiness unto the Lord. Tell your neighbor, brother Salas, tell your wife, we are holiness unto the Lord. God has put us here in this earth to represent him. And everything we do, we do it as unto the Lord. Help us, God. So God raised up Jesus to come. Jesus of Nazareth. Next slide. God raised up Jesus to come and bring us into what he desired us to do in this life. You don't have no idea of where God wanted to take you because he said he wish above everything that you prosper and be in hell as your soul. The state of your mind will determine how far God can take you. And don't be deceived by the adversaries of darkness to run from this one word, holiness. This word is God. And it's a purpose. Everything God gives and every word God speaks, that's a purpose. And where purpose is not known, defeat is inevitable. You will see a, a world full of defeated Christians because they don't know the ways of God. The Bible says they have a form of godliness, but they have denied the power of But not me in my house, say it, not me in my house. Not in this house, not in my assignment. So let's look at this. Notice what the Bible stated about Jesus in John 1, 17. For the law was given by Moses. God gave Moses a law that informed them what we just covered about their error. But grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what we have to learn is that next slide. Jesus brought us into the dispensation of grace and truth. Grace is the favor of God. Grace is the ways of God. He gave us truth through the Lord Jesus Christ to combat the lies of the devil. See, grace and truth prepares you, spiritually prepares you to function in the earth as spiritual sons and daughters of God. No one can function in the earth as a son of God without first being born again. And the Bible says in John 1, 12, for as many that receive him, to them he gave power to become sons and daughters of God. If you're gonna walk in this earth as a spiritual son or daughter of God, you first must be born of the water and of the spirit. Marvel that I say unto you, you must be born again. I don't care how many people say they are a Christian. What makes you a Christian is the new birth. What makes you a part of the family of God is the new birth. But it's a spiritual birth. It's not a natural birth. Nicodemus came to Jesus in John 3 and said, Good master, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Marvel that I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, how can a man enter into his mother's womb or sap from time and be born again? Jesus said, marvel not I say unto you, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not, you must be born of the water and of the spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. We are spiritual sons and daughters of God. Our spirit is made in God's image and likeness. Sin destroys that image. Sin destroys that likeness. Are you out there? Now, we're now living under the dispensation of grace. Jesus introduced to us a new law, a new way of doing things. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We're no longer, once we're born again, living under the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death controls the flesh. 
The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus empowers the spirit to function in the earth as a son or a daughter of God. Now, in Paul's letters, or Paul's teaching to the church, he said in Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's your assignment, to present your body to God and renew your mind on the word so that you can grow in the things of God. On the other hand, Paul wrote a letter to the church at Ephesus in 2.10. He said, we, the church, the body of Christ, the born-again believer, we are his workmanship. We have been recreated, created in Christ Jesus unto good works that we might begin to walk in him. When you got saved, born again, God recreated your spirit. Your body wasn't born again. It was your spirit that was recreated, made in his image and his likeness. And then Paul told the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 4, 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He told Romans, be not conformed to the world, but renew your mind, which is your soul. Now now he's telling the church at Ephesus, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Because if you don't renew your mind on the word of God, you will continue to walk in the old ways of life. And then he told them in verse 24, put on a new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So the Bible says true holiness, that must be a negative holiness. That must be a false holiness. He said we have been recreated in righteousness. So therefore, everybody that say they're holy, look at them. Check their words, their actions, and their attitude. Because if the Bible says true holiness, it must be a false holiness. Now, I didn't say it. God said it. This new man is created after Christ Jesus in righteousness and true holiness so we need to look at this thing about true holiness notice what Paul stated there in this next last second Corinthians 4 verses 1 through 7 therefore seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy he said now don't faint we got a ministry that God has called us to he said now don't faint Tell your neighbor, don't faint on us now. And then notice what he stated there in verse 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonor. That's no longer the church. Not walking in craftiness. That was before we got saved. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestations of truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience, in the sight of God. I need to read that again. Because I want everybody to grasp with it. We have, therefore, seen we have this ministry as we have received mercy, faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. That's the old way, that's the flesh. Not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But, thank God for them buts. That's one conjunction we need to get a hold to. Because there's something following it. By manifestations of the truth. Remember what Jesus said in John 8, 31, 31? He said, you shall continue in my word. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. free. Ephesians 4, 21, he said, the truth is in Jesus. You have to continue in the word and come into the knowledge of the truth. So now he said, by manifestations of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of you got a lot of Christians who want God to bless them a half that's out of order. Yeah, you got a number of Christians who want God to bless what they're doing, and they're so far away from God. They want God to bless their plan, but they don't want to line up with his purpose. 
And God is a God of purpose. When your purpose lined up with God, he'll bless your plan. And the devil will give you a plan to take you from your purpose. God's a God of purpose, everything he does. He has a purpose for doing it. Every word he speaks, he has a purpose for saying it. And where purpose is not known, defeat is inevitable. Now let's look at this. Notice in verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, boy, it is hid to them that are lost. Notice what happens. Verse 4, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, the gospel is the image of God, should shine unto them. And I want to move on. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Now, verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then he said, but we have this treasure. Where? In earthen vessels. Wow. That the excellence of the power might be of God and not of us. It's in you if you're a born again believer. Now let's look at a few. I pulled a few things out there. That first slide. The church at Corinth, they were handling the word of God deceitfully. Wonder how many Christians are guilty of that. They were walking in craftiness, trying to get over on everybody. They were dishonest in everything they did. You couldn't believe it. They were there lying to the to get a dollar. And they were being deceived by the devil and didn't know it. But the Bible says in James 1, 22, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. For you to come and hear a word like this and don't become a doer, you're living under deception. When you hear the word and choose not to do it, you're living under deception and you produce false religion, false holiness. Once you hear the word, the truth of God's word, you're responsible for what you have here. Whether you ever do it or not, whether you ever do it or not, you are responsible. Once you hear the word and, and, and come into the knowledge of the truth, you're accountable to what you hear. Now, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciple indeed, and you will know the truth. And that truth will set you free from anything the devil's trying to do. And the next one, he said, the God of this world, which is Satan, has blinded the minds, the soul of them which believe now. Everybody out there in the world and most of the church is blinded. They have a form of godliness. But they have denied the power. They know to do right. They know they should, they know they should forgive one another, but they refuse to give. And they're living under deception because they find a reason not to forgive. They find a reason not to do what God commands us to do. They know they should walk in love, but they're busy trying to get even with people. And Satan has blinded, even Christians are walking in blindness. Because they refuse to give place to what God said in his word. Because when God gives you word, you're accountable to what you hear. And every word that God gives you will challenge your walk with him. But when they hear the word, Afterward, they repented. And after people hear the word and repented, notice what the next slide say, for God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. God commanded the light to shine out of darkness when they repented of their own. 
That's a word in season, St. Peter's. I wonder where God's going to take us to. But I know it's somewhere good. Tell your neighbor, God's talking to you right now. But notice what Paul stated there. That he said, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. See, the treasure that he's speaking about there is the knowledge of God, of knowledge of the glory of God. He said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, and the treasure that he's speaking about is knowledge of the glory of God. Colossians 1, 27 says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. God on the inside of you. See, the excellent of power is of God and not us. Anything good happened in my life, it's not because of me. Anything good happened in this church, it's not because of me. I can't take no glory for it. God gets the glory. God gets the power. God gets the honor. Anything good that happened, it's because of him. Tell your neighbor, the power that you see, the power that we walk in, the power that we exercise, it comes from God. Give God the glory. Give God the praise. Give God the honor. You ain't seen nothing yet, tell your neighbor. Compared to what you're going to see, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, neither has it entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Whatever he say, do, and you will see the glory of the Lord. Have a seat. Notice that next slide there, guys. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them, and I will walk in them, and I will be their God, and I, they shall be my people. Verse 17, wherefore come out from amongst them and be ye separated, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you unto myself. Verse 18, and he said, I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. So let's look at this, that next slide. See, believers are the temple of the living God. Say that, I am the temple of the living God. Say it loud. Say it like you mean it. See, God lives in the believer, and as we grow in the spirit, grow in our faith, grow in the word, grow in grace, grow in righteousness, we'll begin to see manifestations of what God said in his word. And that second bullet, God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk in them, I will be their God. Boy, that's a word in season. All of these promises God is making to you and I. And then notice, he said, I will be a father unto you. You know what a father's responsibility? To provide for his family, to protect his family. God said, I will be a father unto you and you shall be my son and daughters of God made in my image and I'm like walking through the streets of Whistle Salem, walking through your city, walking through your neighborhood, looking like the father God that you came out of. That's what God wants, sons and daughters. That's what he told Adam in the beginning, to replenish the earth. Adam got into sin, violated God's command, so he no longer could produce sons and daughters of God. But God raised Jesus up as the second Adam. Thank God for Jesus, because he completed what God assigned him to do. Now, everyone that comes to Christ is born again. Now, God is using you to walk it out, using you to walk it out, using you to walk it out. Oh, the Father God himself. I will be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord of hosts. The Almighty God is talking to you individually. God said, I want to be your father. I want to be your provider. I want to be your protector. I want to be your son. I am the one that's going to look after you. You are my son. You are my daughter. I am your father. And no weapon that's formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, it's condemned by many other afflictions of the Lord, but out of the righteous. But God 
God will deliver you. God will heal you. God will bless you. God will take your life to another level. God's not a man that he shall lie. If he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he will bring it to pass. Tell your neighbor, God won't lie. God cannot lie. If he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he will bring it to pass. You can take these promises to the bank and have a seat. Yes, you can take these promises to the bank. Yes, you can take these promises to the bank. God cannot lie. If he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he will bring it to the bank. If you just line up and do what he commands you to do. You can believe God. You can believe God. You can believe God. Don't bring God down to the level of some man. You can believe God. He's not a liar. He's a God of truth. What he speak, he speaks is the truth. Tell your neighbor, you can believe him. You can believe him. You can believe him. Have a seat, have a seat. You know, God is a God of promises. He made many promises in his word and he will stand behind everything he said. But you have a part to play because once he speaks, the rest is left up to you. Now notice what Paul told the church at Corinth after reading all of those wonderful things that God said to us, what he would do. And then Paul charged the church in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Notice what he said, having therefore these promises. Whoa, dearly beloved, whoa. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, why? Perfecting holiness. Perfecting holiness. So you gotta do something with your flesh and your spirit to walk this thing out. And Paul said, God has made many promises to us, great and wonderful promises about what he would do and what he would be in our life. Now, Paul said, now that God made these promises, let us, come on, St. Peter, follow me as I follow the door. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The next slide. Notice what God said. Paul told the church, man, God has made some promises to you. He said, I will dwell in you. I will walk in you. He said, I will be your God. He said, you shall be my people. He said, I will be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters. He said, I will provide for you as a father. I will protect you as a father. Nobody can stop you because I'm behind you. Nobody can defeat you because I'm with you. Nobody. Nobody. I mean nobody. I mean nobody. I mean, nobody can stop you. I mean, nobody can stop you. I mean, no weapon that's formed against you will prosper. I mean, every tongue that rises against you in judgment. I don't care what they plan or plot. If I am for you, nobody. And the one that plot against you will be the one that will fall into the same pit. Because the devil can't make a plan on the earth that God doesn't see. Everything Satan does is in darkness, but God said, I can see inside of darkness. 
God said, I can see inside of darkness. You can't see from where you are. But God stands high and look low. And God said, I can see what your adversary planned. But the plan he had against you would get him. Tell your neighbor, nobody can stop us. Nobody can stop my family. Nobody can stop our business. Nobody can stop our life. Nobody can stop God's plan. And nobody can stop this church. I don't care what they plan outside in their secret places, but God say, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide, shall abide, shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. Tell your neighbors that that's the blessed assurance that we have that no weapon that's formed against us will prosper. And every tongue that rises against us in judgment. Have a seat. Paul said, God has made some promises out of this world to us. Now he said, now, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. You know, James said in James 1, 21, receive with, ma- well, receive with meekness the engraft the word which is able to save your soul. Now, here he's saying, why would God say that? Because God commands us to do it. We are the family of God. We are the people of God. We can't live by the world's standards and defeat our adversaries. You have a world full of adversaries, but see, when we raise up the standard, we're raising up our lifestyle. And God has a purpose for it. Because you don't realize what kind of devils you're going to face out there as you move with God. But see, God will prepare you. He will qualify you today for the devils you face tomorrow. You better learn that right there. David's first attack was on the Goliath. His first attack was the bear. He learned something. Hey, God got me through this. Later, a bar came over. Hey, that same God showed up again. He got me through this. And one day, Goliath showed up. Wonder what day Goliath is going to show up in your life. Boy, that big one, that big one. When you get to that big prize. See, the devil don't send big demons to pr- protect little prizes. See, he'll sign demons to little prizes, little demons. But see, that's going to come a day you're going to face a big devil to, that's protecting you from that million dollar. So you better learn today that God is with you. God is for you. If he did it once, If he did it once, Arthur, if he did it once, Linda, if he did it once, John, if he did it once, he'll do it again. You better learn it, you better learn it. Because, see, everyone is on trial today, and how you deal with the devil today will develop confidence in what God can do. Because we don't have the ability within ourselves to defeat the devil in the flesh. But when you learn how to live in faith, learn how to live in the spirit, you can boldly say, no weapon that's formed against me will prosper in every tongue. Because you're going to hear things and you're going to see things. But if God is for me, 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 In this Christian journey, listen to me, St. Peter's. In this Christian journey, you're going to face opposition. But God will qualify you today for what you face tomorrow. You come to church and get a word like this and walk out of here with a deaf ear, the devil will tear your tail up. He'll wipe you out.
That's my only concern about the people that I know should be here to hear what I'm saying. They asked someone fishing. And they missed the day of the visitation. And when the enemy comes, they have no strength. When they're fighting their battle, God gave them a word, but they didn't gravitate. They didn't hold on to it. Because I know you guys, you've been around me long enough, no, it don't, you don't make no little plans. You're asking God for a big thing, and when you ask God for a big thing, you got to get ready to face Goliath. Yo, you got to get ready today to face Goliath, because Goliath will show up. Now, David's brothers, they ran from Goliath, but David heard it, said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the Lord? Oh, yeah, you're going to face Goliath. Hear me, Lisa? You will face Goliath. Tell your neighbor, tell your friends, sure, you will face the not Goliath. The devil's not going to lay over and just let you go out there and start picking up tools. He's going to see where you are. Here I'm believing God to pay this thing off this year. I know he can do it, but the people got to have faith. To stand up in righteousness, got to have faith to face the adversary and say, I can do it, we can do it, God will do it through me. Perfecting, you know, when you're perfecting holiness, guys, that's a process. That's a process. You still are right where you are today. God's standard, living, that's all holiness is, living by God's standard, living by God's word, whatever he's saying. That's all, just obeying God. It's simple as that. What is holiness? It's whatever he's saying. Living according to his word, not what the world says, because the world gives you living to the act of food. Well, I'm going to get off of it because you get mad at me. But it's a process. I mean, this I'm growing. I'm a lot farther today when I first got started because I entered into a process of growing. I took the word seriously. And God was quiet. I didn't know when I was back in my 20s, I was hitchhiking through Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I was a paratrooper at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, down there jumping out of planes, acting like a fool. <laughs> Thank God, someday when I was hitchhiking, I would hitchhike through Winston-Salem, going to Whitfield, Virginia to see my hammer, my wife, and my kids, acting a fool, Craig. But God would laugh at our ignorance sometimes. That I will be someday preaching here in Worcester, Salem, North Carolina to a dude like Nathan Thompson. You have no idea where God has in store for you. But he's qualifying you right now for what he's going to do tomorrow. And if you walk away from it, you abort your destiny. Now here I am in Worcester, Salem, preaching to you. but I had to go through a process to get to where I am. God don't say, this is what you're gonna do and put you out there. No, he'll put you under a man of God, a woman of God. Follow them through faith and patience who have inherited the promises. God is not gonna throw you out there, you're not ready. And he's definitely not gonna put something in your life that's gonna take you from him. The world will, but God won't. Have a seat. Let's close this thing out. Notice right there, perfecting holiness is a process. Hebrews 12, verse 14. What God said, follow peace with all men. And holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Notice that bullet right there. Here the scripture is telling you and I, without holiness, no man, no woman shall see God. Because holiness opens up, up your eyes. And see, I, I missed something, but I wanted to go there about perfecting holiness. Holiness is perfected when I intentionally do what's right. 
I didn't cover that. Holiness is being perfected in my life when I intentionally do what's right. Remember Hebrews 4, 12 said the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing the asunder of the soul and spirit and, it's an intent, uh, th- and it knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word knows my thoughts, my intention. And when God see me intentionally choose to do right over wrong, when God see me intentionally line up with his word, I, he is developing me. He's really developing my character. When I intentionally choose to do whatever he commands, he knows I am growing up. I am maturing in my spiritual walk. I am, see the truth will teach me how to walk in God's ways. And when I intentionally choose to obey God's word, God see a new image coming to the forefront. He's removing the darkness in my life and the light is beginning to shine. The truth is coming to the forefront. And somewhere down the road, I will qualify myself for my next assignment. Most people don't know it, but Jesus had to grow to a certain level before God released the anointing on his life. And the Bible says at the age of 30, when God was satisfied that his son had learned what he had learned and he intentionally obeyed his father's command, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus qualified himself to enter into the trial of life because somebody had to pay the test for the sins of the world and God raised up Jesus to go through some trials to save you and I. I wonder who God is raising you up today to reach back. There's somebody in your life. There's somebody in your family. There's somebody in this city. There's somebody in this church. God is raising you up to reach in this life. Your life is just more than you. Tell your neighbor, your life is more than you. We live this life for a purpose. Now let's bring closure to this right here. Help us, God, for without holiness, no man or woman shall see God. See, what we got to learn is seeing blinds you. When you're living in darkness, it blinds you because sin produces darkness. But John 3, 3 says, if you're born again, you'll be able to see. And as you continue in God's word, the light of God's word removed the darkness from your life. Amen. Psalms 119, verse number 130 says, the entrance of God's word gives us light. And it gives us understanding even unto the simple. God's light. John 1, 4 says, in him was life. And this life was the light of me. The light of God comes out of the word of God. But notice there in Matthew 5, they blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If your heart is not right, you can't see. And the devil constantly wanted to put darkness in my life to blind me to where God wanted to take me. Notice what happens there if you want to really get into the fullness of God. 1 Peter 1, 22, seeing you have purified your soul. And obeying the truth. How? Through the spirit unto unfined love of the brethren. Notice what it is. See that you walk in love to watch one another. So now we're learning something right here. You have, when you, when you, see you have, your soul is being purified when you obey the truth of God's word. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotion. Your soul is able to see the mind of the spirit. How does it? God does it? When he gives us a word and we give place to it. That's why the devil wants you to violate God's word because it blinds you. You can't see from where you are. But notice there, oh, I love this. I'm bringing it closer to this. First Peter 1, 13 through 16. Wherefore, gird up the lungs of your mind. That word gird means to prepare for action. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus. There is a grace coming forth in your life that God has plans for you to bring you into what he created you for. There is a grace that comes to everyone that gives place to the word of God. And then notice, as obedient children, not fashioning yourself or your life according to the former lust, 
in your ignorance so that old life is no longer there. No, 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 we're obeying the truth. Verse 15, but as he which has called you was holy, so be ye holy in all manner of life, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So here's God talking to you and I, the church. This word is not to the world. They can't be holy. You got to be born again first. This letter that Paul, Paul, God is writing to Peter is to the church. Notice he said, as obedient children, as obedient, when I hear a word, I'm obligated to listen and obey. I intentionally do it. If I could ever tell you anything that will help you, obey God. And whatever he say unto you, just do it. Don't argue with it. Because it's for your own benefit. And see, one of the worst things you can do in this world today, and that's a danger about living in America, you can get a degree and you can make a fairly decent salary. So therefore, there's a danger when you can take care of yourself because you don't look to God. There's a danger when you can make a living and do all of yourself yourself. You don't look to God. We don't seek God for healing until we are faced with sickness. We don't seek God for deliverance until we got a problem that's driving us crazy. We don't even seek God for finances as long as we can work and make a dollar. And that's a danger. That's a danger when your thirst is quenched, your bills are paid, and your belly is full. You no longer see God. You think you can, so your job becomes your God. Your, mom, your money becomes your God. That thing you've been looking to becomes your God. But down the road somewhere, your God's going to let you down because your God's going to face something that he can't get you out of. And if you're wise, you will hear the word today and draw near to God today and clench your hands today that when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will lift up a standard for you. Don't let the devil rock you to sleep because everything is okay today. Don't tell your neighbor, you better listen, you better listen. Don't let the devil rock you to sleep today because everything is okay. You got your degrees, you got your salary, everything is all right now. What if you go to Dr. Lamar and say you got cancer and there's nothing I can do for you? What if your daughter, your son call you, I'm going crazy. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, you say, I go to my bank account, see what to do. You, you come to a place, your money will let you down. People will let you down. What you depending on will let you down. But not God. Because God said, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. I'll be with you always. That's my concern about our young people today. They think they don't need God. Well, I was like that when I was young. I was a fool, but I came to the knowledge. I came to the knowledge. I came to the knowledge. Man, there's a lot I can't do, but my God will see me through. Look at your neighbor and say, you better wake up. You better wake up. Oh, help us, God. But as he which has called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of life. And whatever he say, just do it, amen, because it is written. It is written. Tell your neighbor, you better listen, you better listen. God's talking, God's talking to St. Peter. God's talking, God's talking to me and my house. God's talking, he's talking to you and I and your house. Now what are you going to do about it? What are we going to do about what God is? Here's God want to prime this church. Want to take us up to another level. Here's God want to prime you. Want to take